kind of give us a, uh, an explanation as to why people with diabetes are at risk for circulatory issues or nerve damage in their feet? What is the actual problem? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think oftentimes it goes overlooked. And somebody that's brilliant like yourself, that's, you know, spent uh, numerous years uh, studying cell biology, nutritional biochemistry, uh, signal cascades, things like that, probably makes a lot of sense to you. But to most medical practitioners, medical doctors, podiatrists, we're not able to convey the information like we should. So we start talking about diabetes. We start talking about its many complications. Well, what does it mean? How do we get to the patient in a manner that they actually understand so that we are having positive impact? And what I guess I should say is diabetes, right? We're talking about digestible food source in which we're unable to store our energy for future use appropriately. Well said. I think we, we would all agree to that, right? That's a very and well so said. That, yep. uh, that is a chronic condition of diabetes. And so what happens? Our blood sugars accumulate over time in our blood vessels. And in so doing, the glucose, the blood sugar, basically has free access through the endothelial wall of a blood vessel and can wreak havoc. And I've always said this, blood sugar is extremely naughty. Once it gets into the blood vessel wall, it's inflammatory processes that occur, smooth muscle cell migration, plaque formation, thrombus, decreased blood flow downstream. Now we're in trouble. So we just basically already discussed the circulatory component. Without adequate blood flow, we lack the oxygen and nutrients that are required in order to maintain our skin integrity and or the integument in general. And then secondarily, a similar process is occurring simultaneously because glucose is extremely nimble at the same time. And without its chaperone insulin doing its job, we now have an added component that we're worried about. And I think that that's one of the other variables that you're wanting to talk about today that I'm so passionate about. And that's the diabetic peripheral neuropathy with the loss of protective sensation to the feet. And so what are we talking about here? Essentially, all we're saying is that this glucose, when it's left by itself to travel and do what it wants, it's going into other cell types that would typically use something called sorbitol dehydrogenase, if I remember back to my undergraduate days uh -huh. uh, of biochemistry. And so glucose is essentially accumulating in this cell type, which is essentially the Schwann cell, which is the myelin sheath that is covering the nerve, which is for signal transduction and things like that. And what's happening is that as the glucose accumulates, it's not converted to sorbitol because it lacks that enzyme, sorbitol dehydrogenase. So more and more glucose is entering the cell. I know you know this, and this is redundant, but I think it's important for your listeners. So the glucose continues to accumulate over time, over and over and over. Well, it's osmotically active, right? And so what's happening as it's accumulating more and more and more, it's drawing in more and more and more water. Correct. Now we're undergoing osmotic cell death. Now we're leading to destruction of the cells that are basically the lining or the sheath for the nerves to be able to perform their vital role and transmit signals back and forth. Those two components are a significant detriment to the lower limb. And we've barely scratched the surface. Okay, so this is, this is a great start. Now, explain this, uh, to us, why are the feet the, the, the location at which the damage can occur? Can it also occur in your fingertips? Can it occur in my forearms? Can it occur inside of my abdomen? Or is there something very specific about your feet that has a different architecture than other parts of your body? Great question. And so what we believe to be the case, and I don't know that the literature can necessarily elucidate this at this point in time, is that it's the distal most portion of our body, especially in relation to the heart. And so from a circulatory or vascular perspective, we know that going from macrovascular to microvascular disease, obviously those implications are going to be great the further and further south we get from the heart. So specific to circulatory disorder, circulatory disease, and or vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease is profound in the lower extremity. 
absolutely profound. Does it occur in the hands? Absolutely. It occurs throughout the body, but we see it in individuals with diabetes the most in the distal extremity, the feet, the lower limbs. And when you're talking about uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy is actually a wastebasket term, right? It's just talking about the peripheral nervous system. So we could have damage to the nerves of our stomach, gastro, diabetic gastroparesis. We could have damage to the nerves that impact our bladder, a neurogenic bladder. We could have issues that are going to our cardiac system. So it's really affecting everything. We just throw this term diabetic peripheral neuropathy around. It's basically saying we're having damage to our peripheral nerves, but now the onus is on the provider and or the doctor to basically be working within their specialty, podiatry, diabetes, and saying what we mean when you say that you have diabetic peripheral neuropathy is that you have abnormal sensation to your feet. And we're not doing a good enough job in saying and making the association between neuropathy and absence or altered sensation to the feet specifically. Okay, so that was my next question. So how would somebody know if they're either at risk for diabetic peripheral neuropathy or if they're already experiencing it? So that's a great question. And these are difficult questions to answer, especially at the most basic or surface level. But an individual that's been diagnosed with diabetes, we can say with certainty that they've had, and I think that you would agree with the statement, that they've had elevated blood sugar for a period of time could be months to years Absolutely. prior to the onset of their diagnosis and or symptomology. And so for every day, every week, every year that they've had elevated blood sugars, all of those processes could have and probably have been occurring. And so we don't necessarily know how long it takes for that damage to occur, but we must assume from a diagnosis of diabetes and or pre-diabetes that these processes are active and have been occurring over time. So what can we be doing? We need surveillance programs. If we can conquer breast and prostate cancer through active screening regimens, we can do it with diabetes and diabetic peripheral neuropathy as it pertains to the feet or any of those other variables that we mentioned as well. We need to be spending and allocating more time and resources in order to achieve this goal but it's not unique. It really isn't. We just have to find the time and the energy and figure out what the landscape looks like so that we can deliver the quality of care that's necessary. You also asked what can a patient be looking for, Correct. right? So in regards to symptoms, tingling, numbness, burning, hot poker sensation they complain of, pins and needles, it feels like ants are walking on their feet, it feels like they have socks on when they don't. Maybe it's a proprioceptive issue. They feel like they can't tell where their feet are in time and space. All of those are, are basically at some point in time reiterated by everyone that has diabetic peripheral neuropathy with a loss of protective sensation to the feet. Okay. Would they also feel it uh, closer to their heart as well as they would in, uh, in like sciatica as an example, where you get the sensations that are starting around your hips in your, in your buttocks? in your quadriceps um, that are the nerves that are feeding down to your lower extremities as well? Or is it only a sensation that you would experience at the very distal tip? Yeah, perfect questions, especially for this topic. Specific to the individuals that I treat or have treated over the whole course of the last couple of decades, we see it starting in the distal most extremity. Okay. So it starts at the tips of the toes and has a tendency to progress and it loves to get to that pre-tibial region about a third of the way up, like the, kind of the calf region. It's typically symmetric and it progresses up both sides. And individuals that have had long-standing diabetes, poor medical management over their blood sugars have a tendency to start feeling it in their fingertips. Mm -hmm. They start to notice that they'll drop things often. They can have proprioceptive issues in their hands as well, but the feet predominantly and then secondarily, I would say the look. The, the upper extremity, the hand and forearm. Okay, great. So, so then if let's suppose that you were diagnosed with uh, type two diabetes tomorrow. Okay. You went to your doctor, your doctor said, Oh, Sean, by the way, your A1C is uh, 
and uh, you now officially have type one, type two diabetes. Um, over what period of time, uh, according to your research, would you expect that you could start to feel the symptomology of, you know, having a neuropathic foot? Are we talking it can happen within three months, within six months, or does it take, you know, 10, 15, 20 years to start feeling those symptoms? So historically speaking, I think we have thought that it's been years from diagnosis. Mm -hmm. If I'm the patient and my internal medicine doctor told me that uh, upon receipt of my most recent lab work, my glycosylated hemoglobin was 7.2, uh, I immediately would be interviewing my internist to figure out who the most appropriate podiatrist, kidney doctor, eye doctor, interventional cardiologist is in town that they plan on sending me to immediately so that we could be doing active surveillance to see what my current real-time status is so that we could help uh, you know avoid any of those complications and uh, i would presume that most individuals have some baseline loss of protective threshold or abnormal sensation at the time of diagnosis uh, i see what you're saying okay Okay, it just hasn't so, been appreciated. Right, right, right. And going back to what you were saying earlier, uh, there's literature that definitely demonstrates that by the time your blood glucose is elevated, by the time it's detectable, and your A1C is you know, starting to creep up towards the prediabetes or type 2 diabetes range, that doesn't mean that your blood glucose became elevated yesterday. It often means right. that your blood glucose has been high for many months, and some research indicates as much as five years preceding the onset of blood glucose elevation. So it's just another, it's another demonstration of the human body doing an incredible job at masking the symptoms of uh, cellular dysfunction, right? right? And I'd imagine the exact same right. thing happens inside of the nervous tissue all the way down in your foot, right? Absolutely. And, and I think that this is, an, and this is kind of an right. aside real quick if we have enough time for it. Sure. But I think that th this next statement is fascinating, Cyrus. So, and this is just what I've witnessed over the course of the last couple of decades, individuals with type one diabetes, insulin deficiency, have much lower rates of profound neuropathy, ulceration and amputation than individuals that were insulin resistant before becoming insulin deficient. And so is it because of the fact that individuals that were quote unquote type one diabetic, they don't have what they need from the pancreatic cells, uh, the beta cells of the pancreas. And so immediately they're at significant risk to the point where they're already in the hospital or at the doctor's office and the medical management is instituted in a much shorter form or order than an individual that undergoes the insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia to the insulin deficiency over a period of months to years, mm -hmm. and then symptomology presents itself, and then they wind up in their doctor's office and or in the hospital setting for an acute stay, and then it's determined that that's what's going on. Is it that lengthy period of time that's gone by without a diagnosis with elevated blood sugars or hyperglycemia over time that's led to such greater destruction that ultimately leads to poorer outcomes. So the poorer outcomes happen in the individuals who progress from insulin resistant to insulin deficient over the course of time versus those with type one diabetes. That's what I've seen in personally in practice. And when you read the literature, you read a lot more about the complications associated with type two than you do with type one specific yeah. to lower extremity complications. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because my next question was, does this apply to people with, people with all forms of diabetes? Is it applicable to people with type one, with prediabetes, with type two diabetes, or even gestational diabetes? And it sounds That's like, great... go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. And, and, and so you're talking about, you know, the, the umbrella of diabetes. Can it affect all of, can all of those individuals be afflicted with diabetic peripheral neuropathy or L LOPS, LOPS, loss of protective threshold or sensation? And I think the answer is, Type one is definitely at risk. Type two is definitely at risk. We've seen it in type one and type two. 50% mm -hmm. of individuals with gestational diabetes end up converting into type two diabetics. I know, it's fascinating. Right, so I would, I would almost say yes to gestational diabetes because the half that end up with diabetes 
you and I know the statistics there. If you end up with type 2 diabetes, what percent of those individuals are going to go on to have diabetic peripheral neuropathy with a loss of protective sensation to the feet? And we can get to that. Yeah, that's the next and question. Then, right? Yep. right? And so I, I think that the overarching theme is if you have diabetes or you have prediabetes, you have significant risk for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Okay, so maybe we could write an equation here which would say risk for diabetic peripheral neuropathy equals or is proportional to blood glucose elevation times time. Because yeah, really what you're looking for is two components. How high is your blood glucose and over what period of time has it been high? And if the two of right. those numbers multiply to being a large quantity, then the answer is, okay, you're now at a much greater risk. But if you had a significant blood glucose elevation with a smaller amount of time or vice versa, then you're probably at a lower risk. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds appropriate. And I think we all love mathematics because it's, although it's very complex, it's very straightforward and there's usually one answer. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. I like to geek out. Here we go. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I love it. Okay. So uh, then to go to the question that you just alluded to, um, give me give me a proportion of people who are diagnosed with, we'll call it type 2 diabetes, that is actually affected by peripheral neuropathy. What are we talking? 5%, 10%, 20% or more? Okay. Yeah. So let's go, let's go, if we have the time, let's go one step farther. So we've got 34 million people diagnosed with diabetes in the United States right now. Correct. At least, right? Correct. Roughly 90 to 95% are type 2 right? Correct. Out of that 90 to 95%, 70% of the individuals with diabetes are going to go on to develop diabetic peripheral neuropathy with abnormal sensation to their feet. So let's just, so this is crazy, right? So let's just say 30 million people have diabetes, type 2 diabetes. 70%, 21 million people are going to go on to develop diabetic peripheral neuropathy with abnormal sensation to their feet. And the only thing that we have for that right now is symptom management with medication. So once the onset is there, we can help manage your symptoms with tricyclic antidepressants, anticonvulsants, uh, serotonin, norepi, reuptake inhibitors, opiates, opiate-like substances, or topicals. Just last year in 2020, there was uh, a topical, the first topical, I believe, 8% uh, capsation topically to be applied in your provider's office to help alleviate the symptoms of painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Wow. Those are so, horrible options. I was just going to say, I mean, it's all, <laughs> it's all symptom prevention, right? It's like, oh, okay, you're, you're feeling, you're experiencing nerve nerve damage or, or tingling sensations in your lower extremity here, put this cream on, you know, it's effectively like, like Bengay or icy hot. Okay. Right. It might help you out for like a couple of hours, but then it's not actually getting to the root cause. It's not going to be reversing any of the, uh, the, the nerve tissue damage. And it's certainly not going to be, it's just a band aid that, you know, is going to require more intervention over the course of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's troubling that the medical community I, I want to believe that they have made the association at this point in time that you go from a diagnosis of diabetes to the 70% of individuals that are going to now have diabetic peripheral neuropathy with abnormal sensation to their feet. Whatever that window of time is in between diagnosis to onset of symptoms in the lower extremity, that is an unmet need in the medical community mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And so... We'll reach to your alma mater, Stanford University, the Biodesign Fellowship, mm -hmm. right? That's what they're looking at every single year. They're saying, where are there unmet needs where we can improve patient outcomes through medical device technology? Well, here's one. Here's one for them. What could we be doing in order to help the 34 million Americans that are diagnosed, 90 million Americans with prediabetes currently in real time, or the 463 million people afflicted worldwide. Right. Big numbers. This is a societal catastrophe. Right. And we know the need is there. It's just we're going from evidence based medicine to evidence collection. And I think as we start batching to smaller groups, we'll get the attention that we need. But at this point in time, this is still the, I, I guess we'll say the Wild West. We're not there. Right.